If I film this grill lighter, I can see the flame, but with a special optical setup, I can see the air moving around the flame, or even the jet of fuel coming out of the lighter before it ignites. If I zoom in, I can see incredibly subtle puffs of gas, and if I zoom back out, I can even watch what happens as it ignites in slow motion. These visualization techniques are called shadowgraphy and Schlieren imagery, and in this video, I'll show you how you can set them up at home. I'll link to another video in the description of this one that gives a great overview of the physics of what's going on here, but here's a basic description. A point light source is aimed at a concave spherical mirror such that the reflected light is aimed at a camera. Now, light refracts or changes direction when it passes through different materials like glass or water. But this also happens when it passes through regions of air with different density. This is why you can sometimes see a mirage over a road on a hot summer day. Under normal conditions, the human eye can't detect very small amounts of refraction from subtle changes in air density, which is why I can only see the flame here, but not the air moving around it. This setup with a mirror causes refracted light rays to hit the camera's sensor in different locations, resulting in brighter or darker spots in the image, and making these refractions more visible. Alright, let's talk about the setup you will need to do this at home. The main three things that you will need are a camera, a flashlight, and a mirror. And you do not need a separate fancy camera, you can do this with a cell phone, we'll talk about that in a little bit. You also do not need an expensive mirror. This will generally work better with larger, higher quality, laboratory grade mirrors, but you can get a basic setup working using just a simple magnifying makeup mirror with a concave surface, so meaning when you look at it up close, it magnifies things. Some of the video clips you saw at the beginning of this video were actually filmed using this very inexpensive mirror. You can buy a variety of laboratory grade mirrors online that have a higher quality, more accurately spherical surface. And again, you can buy much larger ones, but they do get very expensive. So if you're just looking to start out with an experiment and try to get this working, I recommend starting out with a cheap mirror and working your way up. Now you need a point light source, which is easy to make from a flashlight just by taping a piece of black cardstock or aluminum foil over the front of it and poking a tiny little pinprick hole in the cardstock or aluminum foil. And then when you turn it on, you just get a tiny little point of light that comes out. You are also going to need to position these three things relative to each other. And again, if you are using your phone, which I am filming with my phone right now, so I can't show you this, but I'll put a picture up on the screen. Then the camera and the light source are attached to each other because your phone has a built-in camera flash LED. So you can still cut a tiny little piece of cardstock or aluminum foil to cover up your phone's LED. And then you will just need to position the phone relative to the mirror as opposed to positioning all three things relative to each other. Now, again, you don't need to spend a lot of money here. If you have a tripod for holding your camera or maybe some clamps that you can use to hold the flashlight in place, all of that is useful, but you don't have to use expensive things. You can use stuff you just have around the house. For example, like one of these little potato chip bag clips to hold on to something or even just pieces of cardboard to prop something else. For example, when I have this camera sitting on the table, the lens is pointed down slightly, but I can just prop the lens up on some cardboard. And you can see I've taped together three or four pieces here, but you can use different numbers to create shims to aim things up and down and then just tilt them to aim them left to right if they're all sitting on the table. Some mirrors like this makeup mirror also have a built-in stand that allows me to tilt it to aim it up and down. And I can just rotate it to aim it left to right. So again, before you get started and try to align everything, just think about what you have available and how you can carefully position things, because as I, as I will demonstrate next, we're going to need to carefully position the flashlight such that the light is reflected into the camera. So the first thing you're going to do once you have all your equipment is identify a distance that is twice the focal length away from your mirror. And side note, I'm using a wide angle camera lens right now so I can fit the whole thing in frame. So don't worry about any weird distortions like how if my arm looks strangely long as I reach in from the left there, or the mirror looks like it's kind of tilted. Don't worry about that. That's just so we can see everything on screen at once. Now, if you did purchase a laboratory grade mirror, then it's going to just tell you the focal length with the information that came with the mirror. So you're just going to double that distance and measure twice the focal length from the mirror. But if you're just using a makeup mirror that you bought at a store, you're gonna to need to find this distance experimentally. And you're going to do that. This is easiest to do by dimming or turning off the lights in the room. 
take your point light source and a black piece of paper and aim the point light source at your mirror, start kind of far away, and hold the piece of black paper next to it and slowly move closer to the mirror. And I don't know how well this is going to show up on camera, but I can see a spot of light on the black paper that as I start farther away is kind of spread out and diffused, and as I get closer, it converges down to a more focused point. And then if I get too close, it starts spreading out again. So I want to now back up until I'm at the point where that light is as focused as possible, and then mark that spot with tape or an object or something so you know that that is where you are going to place your light source and your camera. Now, you might wonder why this is twice the focal length and not the focal length if the light is focused here. And again, there's a great video in the description that gets more into an explanation of the physics of how this works. This has to do with the difference between light spreading out from a point light source as opposed to parallel light rays coming in from an infinite distance. Not going to worry about that too much here, the distance between the focal length and half the focal, sorry, twice the focal length. Point is, if you need to identify it experimentally, just use this technique, hold up a piece of paper, and move the paper and your light source back and forth until the light is focused on the paper. Once you have that distance identified, now comes the hard part. You need to adjust your flashlight, mirror, and camera such that the reflected light from the flashlight goes directly into the camera lens. And it can help to still have your black piece of paper to identify that spot of focus light, which you can see right here because you can't really see it when it's hitting the camera lens. And again, you don't need expensive clamps or a tripod. You can do this just by propping things up on cardboard. So I have my flashlight propped up on a few sheets of cardboard to get it more level with the center of the mirror. And then I can rotate and tilt the mirror to aim the light at the camera lens, which was tilted a little down, so I propped that up on a piece of cardboard. So get that aimed the best you can, again, using a black piece of paper to try and get the spot of light centered and focused on the camera lens. Now, once you think you have that spot focused on the front of your camera, you're going to want to turn on your camera's live preview mode and zoom in on the mirror so you're focused on the mirror and the mirror is filling the frame. And when the spot of light is perfectly adjusted, the mirror should appear very bright. So right now, you see I just have one little bright spot towards the bottom of the screen, but if I tilt the flashlight very carefully, there we go. You can see when the light is perfectly aligned, the whole mirror lights up as a bright circle. So. I am holding the flashlight with my hand now. I'm going to need to go prop a few more things up under the flashlight to aim it a little higher. But again, this is what you're looking for. The whole mirror should appear very bright, and if it is totally white and washed out, then you need to lower your camera's exposure. So you're going to need to set your camera to manual or pro mode. This isn't a photography tutorial, so you can look up how to do that or ask somebody who's a little more familiar with photography than you are if you're not sure how to do that, and lower the exposure so the image isn't washed out, and then the mirror should appear sort of grayish instead of completely white. So I had to put my phone down to adjust everything, but you can see I have it set up here. It's not perfect. The mirror is not centered in the frame, and I do have some dark spots in the mirror, but I found that can happen with the cheaper makeup mirrors, which aren't perfect spherical surfaces, so you might see some defects in the surface of the mirror. But for the most part, I have the entire mirror visible in the frame. I've lowered the exposure a bit so the mirror isn't washed out. And I am now ready to take my first shadow graph images or videos. Here's the resulting video where again, I can see the jet of butane leaving the lighter before it ignites and the puff of air around it as it ignites. None of this is visible if I film with a separate camera from a different angle. It requires the precise optical alignment and setup of my light source, camera, and mirror to produce the shadow graph image or video. So far, I have been glossing over the difference between shadow graphs and Schlieren images. I only mentioned them briefly at the very beginning of the video, but haven't really talked about the difference since. So the setup I have here is for a shadow graph, where light emitted from the point light source is reflected off the mirror into the camera, and if there are any density variations in the air here or different gases, like the fuel coming out of this lighter, that will cause the light to refract. And that refracted light will then hit a different spot on the camera sensor than it would have originally if it had not refracted, resulting in brighter or darker spots in the image. So that is a shadow graph. 
For a Schlieren image, we are going to add a light block just in front of the camera. So this is going to be something like the edge of a piece of cardstock or the edge of a razor blade that cuts off exactly half of that focused point of light. So again, I don't know how well this is going to show up on the camera here, but I have my focus spot of light on this little piece of black cardstock right now. And I am going to position that such that it cuts off exactly half of the light. And again, you don't need expensive equipment. You can do that with something as simple as a little chip clip like this. And what that does is some of the refracted light is now not going to go into the camera at all because it's going to hit the light block. Whereas some of the other refracted light that maybe would have hit the light block originally is now going to be refracted past it and go into the camera. So this is going to help increase the contrast of the resulting image because we're going to have some darker spots where some light didn't hit the camera sensor at all. So again, this is a very careful alignment process where you have to get that light block exactly so it's cutting off half of that point of light. And then if I take my camera and go look at the live preview here, the interesting thing is that this does not result in cutting off half of the image. You might expect that I would just see a semicircle here now instead of the entire mirror, but instead I can still see the entire mirror. And again, there's a video in the description that kind of gives more of an explanation of the physics there. But when you have this position perfectly, you should still be able to see the whole mirror. If I do move it in too far, you can see it's a very subtle difference. I will actually start to block off the entire mirror. So you want to position just where you're cutting off half the light, and the whole mirror should still be visible in the frame. Once I have that positioned, where again the entire mirror is still visible, and I have my light block held in place by the clip just blocking off half of that focus point of light, then I am ready to take my first Schlieren images or videos. Zoomed in on the lighter with the Schlieren setup, including the light block and also using a slightly better mirror, I'm able to see very subtle puffs of gas coming out of the tip of the lighter that weren't visible just with the shadow graph setup. I wasn't able to reproduce it, but supposedly with a good enough setup, you can even see more subtle movements like cold air moving around an ice cube or warm air rising off your hand. So while I recommend starting with a lighter, which is pretty easy to visualize, you can then play with your setup and adjust the alignment or maybe upgrade to higher quality components like a more expensive mirror and see what else you can visualize. Now, just to reiterate one more time, the resulting image quality that you're going to get depends on both your components and your alignment. So even if you are using cheap components, just a cell phone camera and a makeup mirror, it is worth playing with the alignment, just moving things by a few millimeters or rotating them by a few degrees may affect your image quality. So you might want to try multiple pictures or multiple videos with slightly different camera settings, different positions. Don't get frustrated if you don't get perfect images or videos on your very first try. There are also a lot of other variations on this basic experiment that I'm not going to cover in this video, such as using colored filters instead of an opaque light block to produce colored Schlieren images, or other optical setups that involve multiple mirrors or lenses instead of mirrors. Again, it's too much for me to cover all just in this video, but I will provide some links in the description to other videos that show different setups and different equipment. And in the description, you can also find written instructions on our website if you would like to do this for a science project. For instructions for over a thousand other projects in all areas of science and engineering, check out our YouTube channel and our website, www.sciencebuddies.org.